Uh, so hi everyone, thanks for attending our STEM stars. This is now maybe our fifth, you know, fifth one, yeah. Um, our fifth STEM starters. Um, and today we have Yasmin. So Yasmin is a second year PhD student in the biological sciences department at Columbia University. Um, and so yeah, so Yasmin actually, so what sort of motivated you to pursue a PhD specifically in the biological sciences department? Um, so specifically at Columbia, uh, I was really drawn towards the freedom of the curriculum and the program itself. So a lot of other programs had uh, requirements like, um, you know, they made you take, they made you retake all the, like the, the basic foundational courses in biology. Um, and I had already taken all of that in undergraduate. So like, I, and I took several gap years. So I felt like I really didn't want, I wanted to specialize myself in the kind of research that I wanted. Um, that was really my main goal to do the research and answer the questions that I wanted to answer. Um, and so I wanted my classes and anything I did outside the lab to match what I was doing in the lab. And I, fe I felt like Columbia really um, gave me that the most freedom um, in, in choosing, in, in like selecting what my PhD would look like. Um, but in general, what made me want to do a PhD um, is that I love the like the day to day problem solving. Very few jobs can say that, you know, they problem solve and solve puzzles and, you know, discover patterns every day, basically. So it, it never gets boring. Um, you know, sometimes it never gets boring because things don't work, but there's a lot of troubleshooting involved um, and you become really familiar with a lot of the methods that you're using. So um, I like that, the, the kind of like the puzzle piece solving aspect of it. And would you say you were always, like you always knew you were into science and you wanted to sort of do a PhD or was that not, something not you realized more frequently or more, yeah. Yeah, so when I thought I wanted to be a lawyer for the longest time, like I, I even went into undergrad as pre-law um, just because, I mean, I had an attitude and I thought that that's where I would do best. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I still think I'd make a great lawyer, but I, I, I read um, this book and I know it's so cliche, but the, the reason why I'm in science is because of this one book, The, Mor the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And um, this book kind of changed the way I viewed science. I thought science was just kind of like cold, hard facts. Um, but this book talked about how, you know, the first um, immortal human cell line came from this poor black woman in the 1960s who like received substandard cancer treatment, um, but her biopsy created cells that never died. And this was revolutionary for the, the biological field. Um, and the doctor who took the biopsy made so much, made millions of, money, of dollars off of her cells. And she died and her family continued to live in poverty. And they were never told that their mother kind of contributed to this like revolution in the scientific field. And so the, the, the fact that science itself can be so complex and can be so nuanced um, and you know, revolutionizing, but at the same time, really difficult and interesting, and and you know, present you with like ethical issues that you have to work through. Like, really resonated with me. Um, and so, I did my first research position after that, after reading that book, and I found that I I really loved it. It's awesome. And before we start, what sort of like one crazy fact about C. Elegans? or the worms that you'll be telling us about today that shocks you every single day? Uh, crazy fact. I guess that they're, they're so resilient. Like I cannot tell you how many times I've probably created a con bacterial contamination that has not been known to man previously before, but shows up on my plate with the worm and they're fine. They're just chilling. Like they're- nice they can live literally forever. So like their resilience really hits me every single time. I, I've done so much to them and they've just bounced back. Nice, maybe that's, maybe your talk of the title says why they're still around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll let you get to it. Thank you, Yasmin. Mm -hmm.
Alrighty, so <clears throat> uh, I'm going to try to answer, or at least tell you how I'm going, how I want to answer the question of what worms can tell us about 150 million years ago. Um, and I have a picture here of, you know, this canonical picture, like photo of evolution happening um, from monkey to human. And, uh, but I put worms before that because worms were around um, for a lot longer. And um, what's interesting is that they're still around today and they're still around pretty much in the same form. While we personally have evolved pretty quickly, like we don't look like our ancestors, worms look like their ancestors. Um, and that gives us a really interesting opportunity to study them and characterize them um, and, and find out or learn a little bit about what was going on 150 million years ago when worms were around. Now, what I'm primarily interested in um, <clears throat> in my research is uh, the nervous system. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in the nervous system, specifically when it comes to evolution, uh, because we can identify an anatomical differences, we can identify functional differences, but the, 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 the source of those functional differences usually have to do with how the nervous system has reorganized itself over time or not reorganized itself, right? So um, a, an organism's capability of survival depends on um, whether or not it can sense its environment and respond to it effectively. And the source of that information processing is really the nervous system. Um, so that's where I focus my evolutionary study on the nervous system, because I think it's such a powerful tool for evolution. Um, <clears throat> so my main question um, in, in throughout my research, and I'm going to try to kind of structure this in a way where I deliver a, a hypothesis, I tell you a little bit about my methodology, and then a little bit about the results that I expect or the results that I've already seen. So my main question um, is what drives this evolutionary change, right? So we know that things change over time. We've seen them change. We've seen brains change. We've seen bodies change. We've seen organisms change over time. Um, we've identified those differences. Um, like we can say, you know, uh, higher mammals have uh, different structures in their brains that, you know, other um, uh, animals don't. Um, we can say that worms, the uh, nematodes, have nervous systems, but they don't really have a brain, right? Um, but other animals do. Um, but we don't really know the, the, the driving forces behind these changes, right? Like, are there genes that are um, driving these organizational differences? Um, and so my main, my main hypothesis is that there are, right? That there's some molecular substrate or genetic substrate that can explain how um, nervous systems um, uh, are evolving. Um, and just to go over the evolution of the nervous system really quick, uh, especially when it comes to comparing nematodes. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick introduction to nematodes. Nematodes are worms, like you saw in the very first slide, um, and they're tiny microscopic worms. They're about a millimeter, a millimeter long um, when they're adults, and uh, they existed many hundreds of million years ago, like I said. Um, but what's so fascinating about them is that they have 300 neurons, right? While we have 100 billion neurons. Um, so the fact that they only have 300 neurons is great for us because we have identified each and every single one of those neurons. And what you see on the left here is um, what's called a connectome. So it's literally every one of those 300 neurons labeled in um, this nematode called C. elegans. It's the most common nematode used um, as a model in biology, biological research. And they're, um, so each and every single one of these <clears throat> tiny little spheres are neurons in the nervous system. Um, and we, we've identified literally every single one of them, where they are, what they connect to, um, how they develop, um, what their properties are, what kind of neuron there are, they are. Um, so it's really great to kind of have this like map of a nervous system. Um, but again, it's, it's really, really simplified. Um, we, we now know that, you know, the, 
what we consider to be the most advanced um, nervous system has 100 billion neurons. Us, we have 100 billion neurons. And with that many neurons comes, you know, that many more connections, right? And capability to perform that many more processes. Um, <clears throat> but going back to nematodes, we obviously can't um, identify every single one of these 100 billion neurons in humans. It would be impossible, right? Um, we've, this is a wiring diagram on the right of the human brain. And that's, 100, that's 300 neurons in the human brain. And that's as far as we've gotten to labeling three as like the most amount of neurons at once in a human brain. And that because the, the, the human brain is so dense um, in its neuronal capacity, it's just, it's really impossible to zero in on every single neuron and find out how every single neuron is organized within the larger system. So we're stuck with nematodes, right? So we gotta, we got we have to use them somehow to answer the questions that we're interested in about neuroscience. Um, and the reason why I think that uh, nematodes are, are great for neuroscience are because, uh, like I said before, we have every single one of those neurons um, figured out. Um, they have a short lifespan. Um, so, you know, unlike uh, higher mammals, they don't need, you know, many weeks or months or years to develop. Um, they have a three day lifespan. So from embryo to when they're a, a complete adult, that's three days that you can um, mess with, you can study, you can characterize. Um, like I was saying before, they also have this cool dower stage. So when they're uh, young, um, if they're like in a really stressful environment or if they face kind of um, a, uh, like a hard uh, environmental condition, like let's say they, don't have food or um, it's really, really cold or too hot, they'll go into this dower stage, which is like a survival stage um, that allows them to, that literally just, they close their mouth and they shut down most of their process, their metabolic processes so that they don't need to eat anymore. And they can survive in this dower stage for literally years. Um, and that makes them incredible tools for scientific research because scientific research can get really expensive. So when the organisms that you're working with can reproduce forever, can um, survive for years, right, in this dower stage without you having to feed them all the time, um, it really makes for uh, like, a, like a powerful tool that you can use to answer the questions that you want to answer. Yasmin, do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so for the dower stage, like they can, like years versus three days is crazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, do they do they have any like markers of aging? Like if they're if they've been dowers for a really long time, or do they just like get right back to it? Like do they have the same like functionality? Are they just as for the, for the most part? Um, uh, nematodes. So like so they go into dower when they're stressed. Once that stressful condition is removed or they're reintroduced to food, they'll exit the dower stage. And for the most part, they're indistinguishable from normal adults. Um, there are some like very like nuanced, like small genetic changes that we're just beginning to discover um, in in dower adults versus non-dower adults, like like adults who who had gone through dower. Um, but that mostly results in like an in, a sort of intelligence. So like this is where like the multi-generational inheritance comes in of stress. So um, worms that had gone into dower will remember that they had gone into dower and so they'll be smarter in avoiding stress and they'll pass that on to their progeny. So it it like really is just a plus. Like yeah, that's that's really crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So another reason why um, nematodes are so great uh, as a, just a general model, but specifically for a model um, in neuroscience is that they have, like I said before, they have 3,000 3, cells total um, and 300 of those are neurons. So again, we know every single one of those neurons, we've identified every single one of those neurons. But what's interesting is when you look at this ratio, 3,000 cells total in the whole animal 
versus 300 neurons. That means one out of every 10 cells in this organism is a neuron. Just to put it into comparison, for humans, one out of 3,000 cells are neurons in our bodies. So, and we're considered to be like the most evolved nervous systems, right? Because we're capable of so much. But this organism is literally mostly neurons. So why, why is it that um, it has evolved to need its nervous system in such an integral way, right? Like what role does its nervous system play that is so crucial to the survival that evolution has made it so that one out of every 10 cells in this animal is a neuron? Um, and again, going back to the tools that we have um, in, in, in the nematode for neuroscience, um, we've not only identified every single one of these neurons, um, and postdoc in my laboratory has uh, uh, created fluorescent reporters for each and every single one of these 300 neurons. So each of these neurons are labeled in an individual color that is distinguishable by color and location. So you can identify every single one of these neurons. So this, this makes it such an important genetic tool because when we're answering, study, answering questions in neuroscience, usually we do it um, in like almost like a reverse way. Um, it's called reverse genetics where we uh, mess with something and then we see what, what, what uh, happens, right? So let's say you wanna know um, whether or not a gene is important for a certain function, right? Or, or let's say you, you wanna know if a neuron is important for a certain function, um, you're gonna to try to remove that neuron and then see what happens. And then that'll tell you what that neuron is probably important for. Um, and this way we can see, we can zero in on every individual neuron and characterize its individual function uh, and its larger role in the whole system. Now, going back to evolution, C. elegans isn't the only nematode that uh, we have at our disposal. We have a, a bunch of, of other nematodes that have existed for hundreds of millions of years that are very, very similar. Um, the nematode that I'm specifically working on to compare to C. elegans, so C. elegans have, has already been established. Um, it's been an, uh, a nematode that has been used in bio biological research since the 1970s. Um, and that's why it's been so characterized so much. Um, but where my lab is trying to establish Pristianca specificus, um, which is the nematode that you see on the right here. Now, just looking at the, at these nematodes, they look incredibly similar, right? They almost look identical. Um, so I want to ask you, could you, can you guess how many years actually separate these worms? Like when was their last common ancestor, do you think, just by looking at them and how different they look? How many years, how many years of evolution do you think separate these two worms? Ten thousand. Nope. <laughs> One million. Getting warmer. Million? Three million. Hint, it's in the title of my talk. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> 150 million. Yeah, so the last common ancestor of C. elegans and P. pacificus was 150 million years ago. So for 150 million years, that is how much change happened and like evolutionary change happened. So they got stripes and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> right, they got a cool outfit. Yeah. Yeah, so just to put it in perspective, the, the last common ancestor of mice and humans was 65 million years ago. So it is incredibly interesting um, that so many hundreds of millions of years of evolution could have passed and these nematodes could have re retained the same, so very similar structures. Um, and we've we've started identifying or characterizing the nervous system of Christianca specificus, and it's largely similar. It's there are only very, very, very small changes in the in the nervous system in the anatomy um, that we see in Christianca specificus um, compared to C. elegans, and that's incredibly interesting because 
if you remember what I said before, we want to know what causes evolution, right? So it's really, really hard to answer that question when you're looking at a mouse and trying to compare it to a human, because there are so many changes to keep track of. How could you possibly zero in on one, um, like one, one gene or one factor that is responsible for these changes? But when you have small changes that you can easily identify and keep track of, then if you you can more easily zero in on the sources of those changes. Uh, Yasmin, could I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sure. So how much do you think, right? So in, the, in these nematodes, we see a huge amount of time that pass with no change. But how much of that do you think is due to the nematodes being able to go into this dower stage that you say, right? So if there was some sort of selective pressure, they're like, well, I'll wait out the selective pressure versus if there's a selective pressure on the mouse or a human, the selective pressure just kills them. So therefore, if you look at gene flow, there is no gene flow. But these nematodes have a very good way of having gene flow. So it's, it sort of makes me think like, mm -hmm. if it's not broken, why fix it, right? Sort of thing. Um, but I don't know if that's true. No, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't think we know for sure, but I think that's a, a very, very interesting and logical hypothesis, right? They are incredibly resilient. So the, the, the driving evolutionary force is not as strong as it is in mammals, right? Who are um, very susceptible to stressful environments. Um, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Evolution probably happens a lot slower um, in, in, in like, the, like the nematode clade probably, which you see right here. Um, so there are a bunch of nematode species and for the most part, they're very, very similar. Um, but I do, I do want to focus on some differences um, that we see between these nematodes. So on the surface, they are they are they are very similar anatomically and um, uh, as far as their nervous systems are concerned, it seems that they have all the same neurons, um, all the same cells. Um, so much so that the tools that we've created for C. elegans work in Pyrsianca pacificus, um, like almost like the exact same protocols, right? Um, but what is different about Pyrsianca pacificus is that they have a bizarre different structure, a behavioral structure. So they're cannibals, um, or more correctly speaking, they can cannibalize. So C. elegans feeds on bacteria, um, and that's usually its main source of, main primary source of food. Um, but Pristianicus pacificus, if exposed to certain environmental cues, will begin eating other worm larvae or younger worms. Um, and it will literally grow teeth that you see right here um, to do, to perform this behavior. So again, it's incredibly interesting that two very superficially similar nematodes that have survived so many hundreds of millions of evolutionary years can still have vastly different behavioral outputs. Um, even just looking at the foraging behaviors or the movement behaviors of these two nematodes, they move differently too. Pristianca specificus move a lot slower. They're a lot sluggish. They don't respond to a lot of environmental cues as much. So again, when I was talking before about nematodes being such a powerful tool for ev evolutionary neuroscience, um, it's, it's nice to have two species that you can compare that only have a small number of differences between them. Um, so you can keep track of those differences. But those differences, it would, it, it's even more interesting to have those differences result in vastly different behavioral outputs. So it shows you that those small, tiny changes can cause such a different functional output, right? That can um, contribute to the survival of this organism, right? Um, and it, it, that's really what it seems like, right? The Pristianca specificus have different, they live in different environments than C. elegans do. Uh, C. elegans, it's, they're, they're both free living nematodes, which means that they can live in like soil or water or inside other like insects. Um, but wherever you find C. elegans, you will not find Pristianca specificus, right? They have very different environmental niches. Um, and again, because they have so many small 
it's only only a small number of differences between them, it's clear that those differences are the most important differences because those small differences are what led to this capability to survive in completely different lifestyles, basically. So again, going back to my original like main question or hypothesis that um, what, what is driving this evolutionary change, right? And what I've been trying to set up for you really is that the, the in order to answer this question, we need to compare um, organisms that are superficially similar, but give you enough of a difference to be able to track um, cause and effect, right? So you have these very, very small changes in anatomy um, or maybe in, in gene expression, but you see large changes in behavioral output, right? So you, you can be sure that these changes, that these, or, or you can more strongly make the connection that the change, the small changes you're seeing are leading to these big functional like behavioral changes. So I want to go into a little bit uh, of the methodology that we use um, uh, in comparing these two species, right? So uh, if we're going to use C. elegans and Prisciancus pacificus to figure out what is driving evolutionary change of the nervous system, right? So what, how are nervous systems becoming more complex? How are they reorganizing? What is it that is causing these changes, right? In order to do that, like I said before, we need to identify the neurons that we're studying. And in C. elegans, this is really great because we've already done that. We've identified every single neuron, like I said before, and we've uh, characterized what kind of, um, what the types of those neurons are. And by types, um, I mean the main identity of those neurons. So what's really interesting about C. elegans is that each neuron has a distinct identity. So here you see the glutamatergic nervous system. So within the nervous system, you have subsets of neuronal type. You have neurons that express uh, glutamate, um, which is a neurotrans an excitatory neurotransmitter that is really important for sensation, right? For excitation. Um, and the glutamate is normally expressed in C. elegans in their sensory neurons, right? So we know it's very important for sensation. Um, this allows the, the nematodes to um, sense environmental cues, um, to be able to navigate them um, and be able to survive and respond accordingly. We also have identified which neurons are cholinergic neurons. This is another type of neuron. Um, cholinergic neurons express acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter that we know is very, very important in muscle contraction, right? So the cholinergic system basically drives movement in C. elegans, right? Um, so uh, these neurons receive sensory information from the sensory neurons, right? Um, and then they process the sensory information and relay motor signals to muscles and tell them to contract um, in order for the worm to be able to move um, wherever it needs to go, uh, whether that's towards food, um, or away from a predator, et cetera. Um, and again, like glutamatergic neurons are mostly sensory neurons in the nematode, the cholinergic neurons are mostly motor neurons, right? So you can see that in C. elegans, we're developing kind of like a very simplest, simplified um, like nervous map of the nervous system, right? So uh, we have identified the neurons and know what their functions are. And last but not least, there's the GABAergic nervous system. And these neurons express GABA. Um, they're a lot fewer than the cholinergic and glutamatergic system. And GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, and in C. elegans, that's mostly important for um, inhibition of movement and of muscle contraction. So uh, just in the same way that um, uh, cholinergic neurons or motor neurons relay motor signals to contract muscles, GABAergic neurons will inhibit those contractions to um, cause like relaxation of muscle um, during uh, feeding or during mating and, or during certain behaviors um, uh, for, for, for the worm. So all of these neurons work in conjunction together to form a nervous system that results in the behavior 
that the C. elegans needs to do in order to survive, in order to eat, survive, and thrive. And they work in conjunction with each other. Um, and But again, they are, we can break them eat down into uh, different neuronal types in order to keep track of what exactly is each neuron, um, what function is each neuron contributing to? What's what's kind of like the the the, the pathway here um, in in receiving a signal, processing it, and then telling the body to move one way or another or to behave in a certain way. Now I want to show a couple of videos of locomotion. So I've been talking a lot, a lot about how worms move. Um, and so I want to show just kind of like the canonical. I swear this was working before. So this is the canonical way that worms move um, on a plate when you grow them. My computer is struggling. Are you in a new tab as well? Yeah, can you see the new tab? No, we see your slides. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Got you. Here. <clears throat> so this is the way a worm moves normally. It moves kind of like in this very graceful sinusoidal um, shape um, and it moves in one direction. Um, usually, I mean, it can turn, um, but the, the way it moves is usually very graceful, like very like mathematical um, <clears throat> and very smooth, almost like it's swimming. I have a weird question. Does, is it yeah. moving like a snake where it like keeps its, like there's like a dorsal and a ventral way to, or is it like, like a flagella, like where it's rotating? <clears throat> no, it's, it, yeah, it's like a snake, but it actually moves on its side. Mm. Okay. Cool. So now I want to show you guys how a mutant moves. Let me share. So this is what happens when locomotion is impaired, right? Um, when one or more of these neurons that I told you about that were really important in sensing the environment and relaying signals to the muscle to contract or move in one way or, or another, um, this is what happens when those something is wrong with these neurons. So right here is the head of the neuron and that's the tail. And you can see that it kind of doesn't know what it's doing, right? Like it's moving forward, it's moving back. It's even the shape of its body has many more kinks in it than it usually would when it's moving in that sinusoidal shape. Um, shape. So this is what we call an unk worm. An unk stands for coordinated. Um, and the reason why we call it UNC is because there are a set of genes that were identified based on these phenotypes or these behaviors. Um, and they're all called UNC. We have like from UNC1 to like UNC100 and something. Um, that's another thing that I love about C. elegans is that all their genes are named after what happens if you mess with them. So if you mess with an UNC gene, the worm becomes UNC or uncoordinated. So again, it's um, worms present like this powerful tool with um, studying the nervous system because you can mess with a part of it. Um, you can mutate this UNC42 uh, uh, gene, which is what I was showing you, and it causes this UNC behavior, right? Now I want to show you a little bit about uh, sensation as well. This is another um, like locomotory behavior. So like another behavior that neuron, that, that C. elegans need um, 
in order to survive. And this is, this is called a nose touch. So it's like just very easily being able to test whether or not the, the worm can feel something touch itself. So you see like that's an eyelash tip and it just touches the head of the neuron and it immediately backs up. I'm gonna replay that real quick. So see the eyelash tip, it touches the head and then it, the worm immediately backs up. So this is, this is a wild type a worm. There's nothing wrong with it. It's responding exactly as it should. It felt that there was, um, it felt that there was uh, uh, something blocking its path. So it backed up um, and that's what it should be doing. Um, and again, I don't have a video for this, but in that UNC42 mutant that I showed you, this doesn't work, right? So you can imagine that um, this gene, which is mutated in this worm, um, if it's causing all this, you know, impaired locomotion, it's the worm's not able to move properly at all, then it's probably not sensing properly either, right? And this gives us a hint towards where this gene is. Uh, performing, right? What neurons it's performing in. So we want to identify exactly what part of the nervous system um, is being affected or being controlled by UNC42 to uh, cause these behaviors. Now, the it's it has been, um, we've discovered over the last several years that the most important genes in the nervous system are these terminal selectors, right? Um, and these terminal selectors, as it turns out, decide what the type of the neuron is. So let's say you have a cholinergic neuron. Um, uh, we can look at neuron type A. Let's say type A is a cholinergic type. Um, you need a terminal selector, which is the terminal selector A right here, to turn on the gene that tells the neuron that it's a cholinergic neuron. So like I said before, cholinergic neurons express acetylcholine, but how does that neuron know to express acetylcholine and not glutamate, right? Which would make it a completely different neuron. Um, and the answer lies in these terminal selectors, which are other genes that actually bind to um, the, the DNA itself and prevent or encourage expression of those, gene, of the, of those genes. So uh, the UNC42 gene that I showed you before actually is a terminal selector. So UNC42 binds to um, regions of DNA that express uh, uh, um, neuronal identity features like acetylcholine or glutamate in each neuron and tell each neuron what it's meant to be. Right. So for each neuron type, you have different terminal selectors. So it seems that there are these group of terminal selectors that provide a code for the neurons. So the neurons know what it's supposed to become. And here's an example right here for a specific neuron. You have the AIY interneuron. Um, and the AIY interneuron is um, a cholinergic neuron. It expresses acetylcholine, which is called UNC17. It's right here in C. elegans. And its terminal selectors are C10 and TTX3. And those genes encourage the expression of all these other genes that um, are the features of this neuron's type, right? So these are the genes that this neuron needs to express in order to be an AIY. If it didn't express these genes, and these genes can be receptors, they can be channels, they can be uh, neurotransmitters, like I said, like acetylcholine. But if, it, if, if this neuron did not express these genes, then it is not AIY. So it needs C10 and TTX3, which are its terminal selectors, to let it know that it is AIY and it needs to express these genes. And like I said before, UNC42 is one of these terminal selectors. It turns out that it, it is a terminal selector, not just for one neuron, but for a whole circuit of neurons in the nematode's head. And it is responsible for sensation and locomotion. And it tells 
each and every single one of these neurons, we're talking 40 cells. It tells these 40 cells what they need to become. So I want to talk a little bit about this circuit that UNG42 controls, right? So we know that we have identified that UNG42 is a terminal selector. Um, it clearly regulates sensation because um, uh, and, and locomotion because animals move all wonky when they when when UNG42 is mutated. Um, but what exactly is happening on the neuronal level, right? Like what neurons is it controlling? Um, what, what's, what's the pathway here, right? So we've zeroed in on the neuron, the, the circuit responsible for locomotion, right? So, and this begins with the neuron ASH. ASH is a sensory neuron. It's in the head of the animal. Um, and as you can see here, that's its cell body. Um, there's two of them. So uh, another interesting thing about nematodes is that they're very symmetrical. So if you split them in half, there's all neurons on one side or also on the other side um, for the most part. So these are the ASH neurons and their like dendrites or processes extend all the way out to the mouth of, the, of, of C. elegans. And um, this allows it to sense its environment. They actually protrude outside of the mouth. Um, and, and to allow the worm to sense environmental cues and process that sensory information. So it turns out that ASH, this neuron, um, who's exposed to the environment, is the gatekeeper or the gate to this sensory motor circuit that controls movement and controls sensation, right? So... Um, uh, could I ask uh, Yeah, sure. So is this the closest thing it has to like taste? If it's if it's tasting its outside world with the ASH neurons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would say so. There are um, there are neurons that are also structured in this way that are like I guess like they're as close to olfactory neurons as you can get in in C. elegans, and they express like our canonical like gustatory receptors. Um, so the, the same like receptors that are responsible for taste in us um, exist in C. elegans and they allow them to like um, to taste and smell are kind of like intertwined in C. elegans. So they allow them to sense like any environmental cues, like mm -hmm. whether it's like food or like a noxious chemical or, or another nematode, like it helps sense pheromones as well. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so it turns out that this circuit um, uh, is one of such circuits, right, that allow it to sense the environment and sense cues that, that exist in the environment. Um, so it's chemosensory, um, which means that it can sense chemicals, it can sense um, uh, things that are outside of it, like that could be food, they could be another nematode, and it can, and it's mechanosensory as well, so it can sense touch. Um, and these sensations go uh, are sensed first by ASH, which is exposed to the environment. And ASH relays those signals down to other neurons in the circuit that result in movement, right? So ASH is the gate to this UNG42 circuit. And we know that this circuit is controlled by UNG42 because all of these neurons have um, expressed UNG42, right? So when a very distinct set of neurons express one gene, it usually hints that that gene is very important for their function. Um, and so we have ASH here at the top and it's sensing the stimuli, whether that's noxious stimuli or, or uh, mechanosensory stimuli. And then it relays the signal to all of these other neurons downstream. And these neurons are both sensory neurons and motor neurons in red. And then, those motor neurons relay those signals to the muscle and cause contraction, aka movement. So we know that ASH is really, really important for the function of this, of this circuit. So how do we test ASH function, right? How do we know that ASH is, again, going back to evolution, performing the same um, in, in both C. elegans and Persianca specific is? Um, I'm sorry, give me one second. My laptop is about to die and I have to plug it in. Okay. 
I apologize. Okay, I'm back. So again, we've identified a really important circuit in, in, in C. elegans. We've um, identified the neuron types are, that are involved. We've identified a terminal selector, UNC42, that is responsible for, uh, for these neurons knowing what their functions are. Um, but now, so we've characterized all we can in C. elegans, but now the question remains, again, going back to the evolutionary question, how is this different in Persianchus pacificus? Are the neurons the same? Um, is UNC42 also doing the same um, things that it does in C. elegans in Persianchus pacificus? Is ASH even import, as important in Persianchus pacificus as it is in C. elegans? And how we can do that is by, um, just testing uh, the, the sensory and, and locomotory behaviors of the nemato of various nematodes. So here you have a lot of like very different nematodes, C. elegans, C. briggsy, you have Persianchus pacificus here, um, and you have um, a nose touch experiment. Um, and basically it's that video that I showed you where like you take an eyelash and you touch the tip of the, of the nematode and you see if it backs up or not. Right, um, and in, mo in most uh, worms, it backs up, right? Um, and, uh, it, and that means it's successfully sensing an environmental mechanosensory cue. But when you remove ASH, so these uh, ASH plus or minuses here means that plus means ASH is present, minus means that they actually took a laser and removed that neuron from that nematode and allowed it to grow without the ASH neuron. And you see that in most nematodes, when you remove that ASH neuron, that, um, that worm no longer avoids, no longer backs up when you touch its nose with the eyelash, right? So the mean avoidance, it goes down so that it's no longer avoiding this stimuli as it should. And this is conserved in Persianca specificus. You see, C. elegans right here. With ASH, it's avoiding the touch. With, without ASH, it's not avoiding. And then same thing with Persianchus pacificus. So clearly, the function of ASH in sensing mechanosensory cues seems to be conserved. But what happens when it's not conserved, right? So here is an experiment called osmotic avoidance. Um, and osmotic avoidance is literally just you're avoiding a chemical that you know you shouldn't be anywhere near. That's um, basically the gist of it. So in this case, they just put like a drop of glycerol, which is a solution that C. elegans can sense or, or nematodes in general can sense that they cannot swim through and don't wanna be there. So if you put the drop of gly glycerol in front of them while they're moving towards it, they'll immediately back up. Again, it's an avoidance behavior. So. This tests their capability of censoring the chemical in their environment. And um, here they're comparing C. elegans and Persianchus pacificus. And they do the same thing where they see what that avoidance behavior looks like with ASH and without ASH. And as you can imagine, with ASH, um, the, the avoidance behavior is, is correct, right? The, the, with the, the glycerol drop, the worms are avoiding glycerol when ASH is present, which means that's ASH's job to sense this environmental cue and then relay that signal down the circuit that I showed you before and tell the worm that it needs to move away from this chemical. But without ASH, this avoidance goes away, right? So it immediately goes down without ASH. So that means that ASH, again, that ASH is very, very important. Now, on the other hand, in Persianchus pacificus, without, when you remove ASH, this avoidance behavior doesn't go down as much as it does in C. elegans. So that means Persianchus pacificus worms are retaining some sort of ability to sense stimuli, chemical stimuli in their environment, even when ASH is gone, right? 
And what that tells us is that there's, there's been a divergence in neuronal function in this circuit. So we know that the circuit is responsible for sensing cues in the environment and relaying that signal down to the muscle. But we had assumed up until this moment that they, they were the same in C. elegans and Persianchus pacificus because again, like I said before, these animals are so similar um, anatomically speaking. But it looks like the function of ASH has diverged a little bit. While nose touch avoidance seems to be conserved, the seismotic avoidance seems to have diverged a little bit. So, and they actually did another experiment where they removed another neuron called ADL. And that is what caused all the avoidance response to go completely away in Persianchus pacificus. So what, what that's telling us is that in Persianchus pacificus, ASH has evolved to give some of its responsibility for sensing, for, for it, um, sensing chemical cues. And it's, it's given some of that responsibility to the neuron ADL. So that responsibility is now shared, right? So that means there's been a divergence in the, neuro, in the, in the organization of responsibility in the circuit, right? That's really and, interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Are they, are they connected like physically in the circuitry to each other? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, they are actually not as far as I know. So this is, ADL is not even in this sensory motor circuit, right? We, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question in Persianca Specificus, but that's actually what I was going to just talk about now is that the circuit itself, it turns out like exactly what you were thinking has changed in Persianca Specificus. So the neurons that ASH is connected to in C. elegans has, is different in Persianca Specificus. So in C. elegans, ASH is connected to AIA, AIB, and the command interneurons, which are those like red neurons that I showed you in the circuit before, those motor neurons. Um, and then we know that UNC42 regulates this connection. It regulates the function of these neurons and it regulates their ability to, to um, regulate locomotion. Um, but in Pristianca specificus, ASH is no longer connected to the command interneurons, which is bizarre because the command interneurons are the motor neurons. Instead, it's connected to AIY, which we think, we thought in C. elegans at least, it's a sensory neuron. So, but it's still causing, it's the, the circuit still like results in locomotion. So what remains to be seen is how, how is it still regulating locomotion when it's no longer connected to these motor neurons? Like who is ASH communicating to in Persianca specificus in order for it to be able to avoid stimuli like it like C. elegans does? Yeah, does that mean there must be like other command interneurons downstream of AIY in Pacificus? Um, sharing that? Actually, as far as we know, no. Mm -hmm. um, so right now where um, a couple folks in my lab have um, been like, like, very tediously, re like EM reconstructing the entire nervous system of Persianca specificus. So this has been done already for C. elegans, and that's how we got like the the the, the connectome for the nervous system. So we're doing that for Persianca specificus, and for the most part, like literally every neuron that is in C. elegans, there is its counterpart in Persianca specificus. It's almost like a one to one homology. Mm -hmm. So we're not seeing like a bunch of new neurons in Persianca yeah. specificus, but we are seeing changes in circuitry, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it's like these like very, very small changes that are causing a very large behavioral change. Um, and again, we can, we can zero in on this one gene that we know regulates the circuit in C. elegans. Um, and, and, and now what I'm doing is I'm trying to study this gene, but in Persianca specificus, right? So if the circuitry's changed, um, and, and the function has changed slightly, then what, what's causing this change, right? If UNC42 is so important in the circuit, in C. elegans, could it possibly be driving this evolutionary change as well? Um, because it's, it's such a master regulator of neuronal function and type and identity. Um, so it must have also evolved 
to to drive these changes in Priscianka specific is because it just seems like the best candidate to do so. That's so that's that's basically the core uh, of my research, and and what I expect to see that if if UNC forty two is also a terminal selector in Priscianka specific is then that means it's been a terminal selector for 150 million years, even though what it's selecting has completely changed. So there, there, is, there, is, there are characteristics within this gene or, or um, something about this gene has allowed it to perform the same function for different neurons, for a different circuit um, across hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And if we can find out why, that'll get us that much closer to answering what really drives evolutionary change, right? Um, and using the nervous system as a, as a model to, to explain this. And these are, these are my, my buddies, again, um, that I'm sure now they don't look that much similar to you because I've explained all the differences that are between them, even though they look very similar on the outside. Totally different. <laughs> oh, I love it. See elegance. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm a sucker for C. elegans memes. <laughs> I'm sure there's like a C. elegans Facebook meme group out there. There is. There is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, its little monocle is so cute. I love it. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. That's great. You, Asmin. Thank you. All right. It's already it's already 12. Um, yeah. Anyone have any follow up questions? Oh, I have a question. Are you able like in a dish? Are you able like up close? You can tell they have ridges, but but like, do you struggle? Do you ever have a like a mix up or like where you have to distinguish between the two? Yeah, I have to keep them really separate. Like they can't be on the same plate because I, I would not be able to tell them, tell the difference by eye. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you. Thank you so oh, much really for, cool. for your time yeah. and for, for talking with us. And uh, I'll turn this into a YouTube video as well and, and post it to our site. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. All right. Take care.